So we're getting to the halfway point of this year's program, firmly in the middle of things. The session coming up is called Real Time. Design relies on the power of observation. Observation improves with distance. We can look deep into the past or far into the future and see problems and possibilities with clarity. It is much more difficult to respond to the world unfolding all around us right now in all its closeness, contingency and complexity. We are, as of this moment, ensnared in an entangled reality of climate crisis, global pandemic and social inequality. And all of our actions are mediated by technological interfaces so advanced that they may as well be magic. But respond we must. We cannot stand by passively and watch our future become the past. We need to find the tolerance, the tools, and to interrogate the infrastructure and ideologies of the present moment. Technology will get us out of this mess. Technology has created this mess. Technology is what we make it. Welcome to real time. Our next speaker is the Australian-born, New York-based artist and environmental engineer, Tiga Brain, Assistant Professor of Integrated Digital Media at New York University. Tiga is a translator and a storyteller. She delves into the inner workings of machine learning algorithms, extractive industries, and tech company logic, creating poetic projects that explain and offer alternatives to present day systems. So through Tiga's work, we, we learn more about the sometimes bizarre, sometimes terrifying consequences of a world fueled by abstract data. We see the accumulated reality of all New York real estate, a teetering pyramid of inflated capital and visit post-natural landscapes cultivated and sustained by AI. Today, Tigo will share two recent projects that attempt to realign the virtual realm with its physical all too real consequences. Following her presentation, she will be joined in conversation by Living Cities Forum Creative Advisor, David Newstein. Welcome, Tiga. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, yes, I'm, I'm very sad that uh, I, I can't actually be with you all in person today. Uh, and my heart really does go out to everybody in Australia who's in lockdown. Um, I've been living and working from the traditional and unceded territory of the Lenape people uh, for the last few years. And this is a place now referred to as Brooklyn, New York. Um, so I want to acknowledge and pay respects um, to Indigenous elders, past, present and future who have stewarded this land. Um, as, yeah, thank you for the intro, David. As um, you've said, I'm originally from Sydney, from Gadigal land, and my work examines issues of ecology, how our ecological entanglements are perceived, understood and imagined, and how this sort of ecological thought or imagination shapes our technologies and our systems of infrastructure. Um, my work examines what is seen as success or failure in what we build, how this is decided and who gets to decide this. Um, but I'm also concerned, you know, with sort of the reverse. So how the design of our technologies opens up or forecloses ways of thinking and being. So, you know, how do our technologies design us? Um, as an artist, uh, and a thinker and a writer, I use my practice to sort of animate and materialize questions, questions um, of the hard to see norms and assumptions that are based into our technologies and to uh, the imaginaries and myths that drive them. Um, I ask in my work, I ask questions about the systems we make, um, how they produce ways of acting, how we can intervene in the world. And of course, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in this work. And so my, as you'll see, my work often is like publicly probing, you know, where we might have agency, how we might rethink or redesign or remake um, the world and the systems, you know, in it. Um, so I often call this type of work, this way of working eccentric engineering, where I'm, you know, often trying to like build systems that decenter the human in how we design or engineer, um, or I'm asking questions like, what would infrastructures look like that support, you know, other forms of relations, mutualism, for example, um, maybe mutualism between humans who are seeking to wash their clothes in a wetland that's also great at purifying water. And so this is what I'm attempting to do here in this work called Coin Operated Wetland. 
Um, but I'm also really interested in inefficient interfaces and technologies. So what happens when things aren't optimized as we expect or in ways that we think we want? For example, this smell-based dating service, and this was an online service that connected people based on smell rather than any sort of visual or demographic information. Inefficient, but uh, very moving. <laughs> so by probing and exploring where conventional systems leak or fail or work in unoptimized or inefficient ways, we can often glimpse other ways of being in relation in the world. And so today, yes, I'm going to share two very new works um, that are exploring some of these questions in, in different ways and that are specifically looking at issues of climate change, climate design and, you know, potentially climate engineering. And so when I say climate engineering or even environmental engineering, you know, images like this might spring to mind. So what do we see here? We see, you know, feats of design and engineering. We see quantification, you know, we see, like carbon and accounting is implied. Um, to zoom in a bit, you know, we see projects such as like massive tree planting or impressive large scale speculative, and now emphasize the word speculative machines, like, like artificial trees that are attempting to draw down carbon. Um, even though most of these things are, you know, in the very kind of early R&D phase. More controversially, you might spot, you know, interventions like solar engineering, you know, which is attempting to sort of manage solar radiation entering the atmosphere. But what we see here are stories of engineering at scale, grand schemes to, you know, save the planet, if you like. And I'm really interested in these proposals and in these, um, this area of research. You know, as researcher Holly Jean Buck argues in her book on, called After Climate Engineering, you know, we are so deep into the climate emergency that we do need to grapple with how we are going to better manage the carbon cycle. Um, so there is no shying away from this challenge that is ahead of us. Um, but I also invite you to consider what's absent in this image. You know, first of all, we don't see any people, right? Um, so there's this sort of suggestion that somehow there's still this kind of separation between, you know, the humans and environment. Um, engineering and design involves, you know, is sort of shown here as this one-way process of acting on the world. You know, the, the landscape is sort of presented in this neat, tidy backdrop, visual, uh, visually implying that kind of things are under control, um, that, that, you know, we can sculpt the world or optimise it to our own will. We don't see any indications of like emissions reductions or lifestyle changes or, you know, even how we've gotten to this stage of climate breakdown. We see a story of science rather than a sort story of corruption, deception, willful negligence, um, murderous negligence, we might say, you know, where industries and politicians have and are still failing to act in our best interests and the interests of the biosphere. And so, the two works I want to share today sort of contend with some of this. They try to reframe the climate crisis and climate action and the management of the carbon cycle in different ways. And the first does this by understanding climate not as a problem of science, but rather as a problem of narrative. So yesterday, Manhattan looked like this, <laughs> covered in a blanket of smoke that stretched the entire North American continent all the way from the massive West Coast wildfires that are now burning. And I know you all know like what that feels like, you know, after living through the Australian fires of 2019 and 2020. Um, so we are definitely witnessing what Australian science, climate scientist Joel Gerges calls the great unravelling. What could be described without exaggeration as, you know, the most significant event in human history. Um, and yet, you know, climate change still fails to regularly make headlines or front page news. This graph was widely shared on social media today, um, showing, you know, a comparison of how much time um, was spent covering Jeff Bezos's, you know, flight into space compared to how much time was spent covering climate in 2020 on um, one of the um, TV channel, broadcast TV channels in the US. Um, shocking, right? Um, 
And so the business model of the media and the internet mean that many news outlets rely on revenue by selling ads that run alongside stories. The more traffic a story receives, the more money it earns, and there's, there's this incentive created to optimise news coverage and journalistic endeavours for views and clicks, signals that are assumed to indicate the online crowd, the digital gathering, the appearance of human engagement. So engagement data is determining how stories are aggregated, shared, promoted, what's getting covered. Um, and sometimes there isn't even a human in the loop, right? So URL pings, page requests, mouse clicks, all this engagement data determines the value of reporting and its sort of visibility online. You know, but should uh, issues, existential issues like climate be contingent on such signals? And should action be contingent on these sort of inscrutable algorithmic systems? And these are really the questions being explored in this project, Synthetic Messenger, just recently um, launched. Uh, it's a collaboration between myself and my longtime co-conspirator, Sam Levine. And it's probing this algorithmic media landscape. It's a work that takes the form of a botnet. Um, a bot is an algorithmic process. It's programmed to automatically, a bot, generally this is, you know, what, how a bot is sort of understood, right? It's uh, these algorithms programmed to carry out online activities, such as generating text and posting it to social media, or, or clicking on content, or listening to keywords or hashtags and automatically reposting content. So basically, you know, bots are used to sort of simulate human interactions with online platforms. And a botnet, you know, is a large number of these algorithmic processes sort of running together at scale. Um, and so our botnet, the one we built in this project, is programmed with the goal of artificially inflating climate news. Um, so every day our system searches the internet for recent news coverage of the climate crisis, and then it feeds the URLs of these articles it finds to 100 bots that then over time visit all the articles and click all the ads running alongside them. So we're driving traffic to climate reporting and in doing so, potentially amplifying and making this content more visible and more lucrative to media outlets by generating advertising revenue. Um, so Synthetic Messenger, you know, in this project, we are, we are leveraging this behaviour, um, the behaviour, you know, of how the media is driven by engagement data and its automation. We're leveraging this um, through this other automated system. So essentially, you know, we, our bots are talking to their automation or their bots, right? We've got bots talking to bots. Um, and in doing so, we're trying to draw more attention to the climate crisis and sort of curate attention um, in different ways. Um, and also reveal the way that algorithmic logics are changing the production and consumption of media and reporting. Um, so as you can see, our bots were sort of unusual in that they're animating their activities. Uh, this is not how a bot typically would work, but we did a call out to our community who donated hands and voices. And so every bot had a sort of own personality. And these could be experienced in the context of a Zoom call. Um, and so the work sort of takes the form of this algorithmic performance running over a number of days or weeks um, where one can sort of join the call and commune with these. Scroll, click, 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 scroll, click, click. Scroll, click. click. Scroll, click. click. Scroll, click. Scroll, click. Scroll. Click. Scroll. Scroll. Click. 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 Scroll. Accompanying the this sort of performance, um, the the website for the project. So the project is an online project. Um, shows the stats and activities of the botnet. Um, so it ran for two weeks, uh, recently launching in, a, in a, the STRP festival in the Netherlands. Um, and in this time, it visited over 2 million sites and clicked over 6 million ads. And so the, the website is showing the live data and the actions of, of the botnet. Um, and so of course the media is this crucial space 
for translating scientific findings, for holding corporate and government actors accountable, and for producing political pressure um, for action. And in all these capacities, it's therefore a critical space for determining the future state of the atmosphere. Um, and the fossil fuel industry has known this for a long time. So through use of lobbyists and enjoying the unwavering support of um, figures like Rupert Murdoch, you know, the fossil fuel industry has worked to control the climate narrative um, via the media. They know that those who control the media cycle have an outsized capacity to influence the carbon cycle. And so this is sort of our representation of this um, in the image you see on your screen. So this is not news. Um, Industry-backed media manipulation strategies are well documented and include, you know, there's a whole host of them, undermining scientific credibility, um, promoting and, and funding inaccurate research, down um, playing risks, promoting false uncertainty, and all of this has produced what climate futurist Alex Stefan refers to as predatory delay in our climate response. Um, strategies also include quite sophisticated techniques like narrative, framing narrative. Um, and, you know, on the screen, you see a screenshot from BP's, uh, the first carbon footprint calculator made in 2004. Um, and so this was, you know, funded by the oil company BP. Uh, to really kick off the framing of um, carb, uh, climate response on an individual level, right? So that we are all to individually reduce our carbon footprint as a way of just deflecting attention and responsibility um, away from industry. So, you know, here we still haven't held industry accountable for this. Um, and, you know, there are also an evolving catalogue of media manipulation strategies that leverage algorithmic and economic logics of online platforms. And so the use of media trolls and bots for amplification of misinformation is common. And such, uh, such as this example that happened during the Australian fires in 2019, 2020, uh, where, you know, there was this sort of emergent um, narrative online that the fires were attributed to arsonists um, to sort of deflect from the fact that we were witnessing a sort of climate breakdown event. Um, and so, you know, amplification happened through, uh, you know, hashtags, automated posting, retweeting of this arson um, narrative. Now, you know, all automated posting or programming bot-like activity, you know, it's actually a regular and everyday P PR activity now. You know, in the context of COVID, you know, you might see a hospital that's making an automated post every day of their COVID stats. So not all bot activity is nefarious. Um, sometimes it is useful messaging. Um, so it's not so simplistic that, you know, automation is to blame here. But it is absolutely the case that, you know, automation is being used to spread and amplify climate misinformation, like in this example. And this remains a genuine challenge, especially in a media ecosystem that re remains very sympathetic to climate deniers and fossil fuel lobbyists. Um, so, you know, the pandemic has demonstrated many things. Um, and one of them is that platforms like Twitter are really willing to moderate user content and misinformation with warnings such as the one you see on screen being placed under posts that are maybe spreading vaccine misinformation. However, Twitter and Facebook refuse to moderate climate misinformation, a stance that essentially does make them platforms of climate denial and deception. As climate writer Emily Atkin argues, the climate story, again, is no longer one about science, but it is a story of injustice, corruption and deception, and it always has been. In her words, climate change is the result of a 40-year campaign to lie and prioritise short-term profit over the health of vulnerable people. Our actions and inactions have distinct atmospheric effects. The news we see and the narratives that shape, um, the news we see and the narratives that um, we hear and believe shape our beliefs. And this directly shapes the climate. So synthetic messages serves as this provocation to see media itself as a form of climate engineering, a space where narrative becomes ecology. 
And so the second work uh, I'm going to share today is called Solar Protocol. Uh, it's a little bit of a change of direction here. And this is a work that uh, responds to also to the climate emergency and the questions of how we design uh, in response. And a common thing we see is that we need more data, more accurate modeling tools. Um, there's this sort of drive to build better models and, and produce these computational tools in order to make better decisions. Um, however, Solar Protocol attempts a reframing of this. It is trying to articulate an alternative way of making decisions about the environment. And it seeks to recognize more than just human intelligence, and more than artificial intelligence um, and is exploring what we are calling natural intelligence. And this project is a collaborative work. Um, it is a collaboration with Benedetta Piantella, um, who is a technologist and designer, and Alex uh, Nathanson, who is a specialist in solar powered art and has just put a book out on solar powered art practices. And of course, you know, we are also working in collaboration with a lot of volunteers around the world um, who are helping us make this work. This work all started in 2018 when I came across this website by Low Tech Magazine, who had designed, redesigned their entire archive and site, setting it up to be hosted on a solar powered server. So a solar server is a sing, small single board computer, um, you can use something like a Raspberry Pi, and it's powered by a solar panel and a battery. So it's not reliant on grid electricity, although it is reliant on, you know, the internet, right? Because it is a server and one accesses it via the internet. Um, but due to this sort of reduced power situation, um, you know, Low Tech Magazine had to redesign, make a whole lot of different design decisions, right? So you see the images are monochromatic, they're dithered, because they try to reduce the size of all the assets on their site to reduce the computational work required to serve them and reduce the energy demand. Um, you can see that on the site, there's information about the battery level. So that yellow section is showing you the battery level at any time. Also the conditions at the side of the server. So we see all this information about the server and its situation that typically is totally masked by the cloud. Um, and I just, you know, was so inspired by this work because it is such a powerful reminder that despite us calling it the cloud, you know, planetary computing is a massive resource intensive endeavor that demands eye watering quantities of freshwater, energy, mining, exploitative labor practices and so forth in order to exist. Um, this, the, the, the other profound thing I think to notice here is you'll see that the, the subheading on the site says, this is a site that will sometimes go offline because of course a property of renewable energy is that it's intermittent. So renewables like solar and wind are obviously environmentally contingent. And thus, you know, there's this inconsistency that's quite uh, at odds with the sort of expectations and culture that we've developed around, you know, fossil fuel or extraction based energy. Um, so the, the project contains this really in, interesting question for me, which is like, you know, what does low carbon culture look like? What, what opportunities do we have to explore aesthetics and expression and so forth if we are driven by a different set of design parameters that might come from uh, renewables or, or low carbon practices? And so we set out um, to start messing around with solar powered computing, putting together our own version of a solar server. And through doing this, um, came, uh, came across the idea or developed the idea of connecting all of these servers up to try to create a solar powered network. Um, could the configuration of a computer network, you know, computers are great joined together. <laughs> could this um, mean that the website could maybe be less intermittent or could we create a website that is then served from wherever there might be the most sunshine in that network? And so that was the beginning of the Solar Protocol project. It's an experimental computational network that's made up of a series of solar powered servers, each set up in a different time zone and weather system around the world. And the servers collectively host uh, the project website, serving it from whichever location is in the most sunshine. And so in this way, the work explores a logic and an automation that comes from the environment itself. So the routing logic and where your traffic is sent is determined by the sun. Um, 
Each server is stewarded by volunteers in different locations. Um, and so this is where we currently have servers uh, set up with the dotted lines indicating the ones that are where installation is in progress. So we have one in Newcastle, Australia, which is probably visible to you now. Um, and we have one coming online in Alice Springs soon. And so this work playfully reconfigures what's known as the Domain Network Service Protocol or the DNS protocol. Um, so DNS is this decentralized system that essentially associates uh, URL to IP address. So, you know, when your browser, when you ask for solarprotocol.net, your browser is sent to the DNS server, the um, IP address is sent back, and then that IP address directs you to wherever the website is hosted across the internet. And so for large scale, high volume web services, you can imagine like Google, um, the DNS protocol is typically set up to direct traffic to whichever server gives the quickest response time. Because of course, Google has data centers and servers, you know, everywhere. Um, so whichever server pings back fastest is likely, you know, that's probably where your web, web traffic is being sent. And so this is the logic of the internet, right? Where speed is prioritized over all other factors that determine how a network operates a characteristic that's really prevalent in digital culture. But it doesn't have to work this way. Um, so in Solar Protocol, you know, our network is built with this different logic. Each of our servers checks in with each other. Um, and the server that's generating the most solar energy uh, at the time becomes the active server and sends its IP address, sets, up, sets it up with the DNS server. And so that, that means when, a, when someone visits the website and their browser asks for the site, um, their request is then sent to that active server that's in the most sunshine. So we're sort of playing with the DNS protocol in this way. Um, and so in our network, decisions about where to move computational activity then happen according to where there's the most naturally available energy rather than according to what was going to give you the quickest results for the user. So we've sort of shifted away from this user-centered logic to a like environmentally centered logic. Um, in other words, in solar protocol, you know, the distribution of sunshine and therefore energy around the planet determines that DNS configuration or that path between client and server. Um, and so, you know, here, you know, each individual server only offers intermittent connectivity, but when connected as a network and the more servers that join the network, you know, the more um, capacity the system has and the more it's able to distribute its activities according to um, Sunshine. And so in this way, the decisions here are automated by a kind of natural rather than artificial intelligence. So if we think about, you know, what, what how do we define intelligence? Well, one way of thinking about it is it's this capacity to like synthesize knowledge and apply, synthesize knowledge as logic and then apply that logic to make decisions. And so in Solar Protocol, um, the intelligence sort of emerges from earthly dynamics and emerges from that sun earth interaction. And so the project raises this question of what gets to be recognized as logic and therefore applied as intelligence. So we've heard a lot about artificial intelligence over the last few years, where logics come from massive data sets that are statistically analyzed for pattern correlation. But what of logics that might be applied and under, but what of other logics that might be applied and understood as intelligence? What of intelligence that might ne neither be artificial nor human, you know, that which we are provocatively calling natural intelligence? And I know the term natural uh, is, is fraught. <laughs> We're not using it to sort of return to some kind of like modernist fantasy that, you know, separates the humans out from everything else. But it's a provocation, you know, and it's, we're using it to disturb that dualism that's already in that word artificial, right? Artificial um, implies a sort of separateness. Um, and it's not just, this is not just a linguistic thing, but it's strategic. Um, the, the term artificial, you know, obscures the exploitation of human labor and human intelligence that's central in what we call AI today. Um, and, you know, Amazon's cynically titled service called um, Mechanical Turk reminds us of this. They're referring to 
the um, historic example of the automaton where there's a grand chess master hidden in a machine and it looks like the machine is, is playing chess. And so, you know, how do we recognise that there are more diverse forms of intelligence and logic in the world and how do we learn to work with these in, our, in, an, in design and in infrastructure? Um, it's also easy to overlook that, that these sorts of automations exist outside of the human. You know, multi-species entanglements, relationality, these are all um, part of what we call wilderness or part of what we call an environment that exists without us humans. So reproductive cycles, vegetative metabolism, automated material cycling, you know, all of these things happen in an automated way in the environment. Um, without human intervention. Um, you know, and like, na like all infrastructures, um, natural intelligence becomes most visible in its degradation. And this can be seen in the ecological crises we are witnessing, you know, where we're seeing this sort of unraveling of automation, you know, as, as um, species interactions break down or climate interactions break down. And so it's really urgent, I think, that we learn how to recognize design with natural intelligence. Um, and perhaps this is a useful thing about AI and working with AI. You know, as theorist Benjamin Bratton has asked, you know, does AI offer us this Copernican turn as a way to recognize that we don't have a monopoly on intelligence or automation and that it sort of exists more broadly um, in the world and outside of us and outside of the human? And you know, this could be one of AI's sort of most valuable effects. Um, uh, we also took inspiration from a project by artist um, Joanna Moll called Hidden Life of the Amazon User. Um, and in this project, she audits and records the eye-watering amount of computational work that is required um, by her browser when she goes to Amazon and buys Jeff Bezos's books called The Life and Lessons and Rules of Success, for Success. And she shows, what she shows, you know, as her browser is doing all this work, is that Amazon is expert at capitalist logic, right, that incentivizes the exporting of costs to someone else, somewhere else, right? And we see this in the way that Amazon outsources its costs to the state, you know, where many of its workers are forced to use social services like food assistance, because they're not paid enough. And then we also see this in how their website is designed, where they're outsourcing costs to the user. So when you buy something, you're paying for that computational work through your electricity costs. Um, and yet this computational work is, is um, producing a lot of value for Amazon, right? So they're on selling your data, they're using it to you know, make predictions about what you book you'd like to buy next. And so it's very valuable. Um, and so there's this sort of outsourcing at play. And in contrast, you know, in Solar Protocol, we attempt to be accountable for this way that, you know, computational work is material. Um, we generate all the visualizations server side. So we're not using like a JavaScript, which runs in the browser because, you know, the browser might be fossil fuel energy. We don't know, but we do know our servers are solar powered. So we're trying to think about like as designers, you know, where, what are the implications of the decisions we're making? Um, and this visualization that is up on screen um, is showing the sort of activity across the network. So each ring is a server uh, and the yellow is indicating sunshine levels um, and the lines are in, uh, showing that which is the active server. So you can see that, you know, when the sun comes up in different areas, it, it's sort of, um, moves to that active server. And so, yeah, I return to this question, what does low carbon culture look like? Um, you know, does it look like being accountable for one's design decisions? Does it look like um, perhaps stopping work if your server runs out of energy and going and doing something else? And this is what happened to us, you know, in the middle of the New York winter when we were working on this and the batteries would run out of power. We'd, we'd, we'd call it a day, right? You know, and so, thinking about how design designs, right? Technologies are also designing us as future humans and our future behaviors and our relationships to work and rest and sleep and all of these different things as well. Um, finally, the work also is really uh, inspired by indigenous scholar and plant scientist, Robin Wall Kimmerer, 
who has examined this um, and, and written a lot about this idea of the honourable harvest. And so this is an Indigenous protocol. It exists in lots of different formats and permutations across North America. Um, and it is, uh, yeah, and as she describes, you know, the Honourable Harvest describes practices and philosophies that guide the manner in which we take from the living world, protocols of asking permission, evaluating impact, taking only what you need, using appropriate technology, demonstrating respect and reciprocating the gift. Um, and, you know, some of these rules include, like, never take the first plant that you see or never take more than half. Um, both of which are deceptively sophisticated species management protocols, ensuring that you firstly are never going to take the last member of a species, and secondly, that you don't over-harvest a region um, so that it can regenerate. And so this idea of the protocol to manage an environment is something that I think is very powerful. And, you know, re renewable energy production takes a step forward that step towards this kind of more honourable environmental ethic, right? Um, in solar protocol, we have a system that's governed by a protocol that, you know, curtails its operations based on the available energy that it's able to produce itself. And the work, you know, also really pushes back on the imagination for computing. Um, you know, the foundational idea in the, in the field of computer science is this idea of the Turing machine, where you have this uh, machine that can sort of record data on this infinite roll of tape, right? And so this idea of the infinite roll of tape uh, has produced this imagination that computing is unlimited and that it is infinite. Um, and, you know, we, I think we readily forget that there is no such thing as an infinite roll of tape. If we look at projects such as this project um, from the EU called Digital Twin, um, where they're trying to develop, you know, a perfect virtual simulation of the world in order to better make policy decisions um, using extreme scale computing and real time exploitation of all available environmental data, you can see that this imagination and this sort of ideal of infinite computing really uh, persists and is being touted as the sort of, you know, response to the climate crisis. Um, but I, you know, I ask you, like, is it a lack of data or a lack of computing that is really the problem here? And there's a few examples on this slide of, you know, 1857, a little known scientist, Eunice Foote, pointing out that CO2 is warming. You know, she says an atmosphere of this gas would give our Earth a high temperature. Limits to growth in 1970s, you know, about pollution. And then, you know, 2017, uh, over 15,000 scientists signed the warning to humanity a second notice, uh, detailing our climate peril and the need for rapid and radical transformation. And this is the most signed document in human history, right? So it's not a lack of information. It's not a lack of knowing what is happening that is the bottleneck here or is the disconnect. Um, and rather, I think this sort of pursuit of data and computation is often a big procrastination strategy for, for predatory delay, you know, um, where we put off action rather than changing ourselves and changing the ways we're living. Um, so Solar Protocol hints at this sort of model for algorithmic governance or automation that comes directly from climate dynamics themselves. Um, rather than automating decision making with AI or massive amounts of data or machine learning, can we automate it by paying attention to the environment and by recognizing that there is intelligence and ways to make decisions outside of the human? You know, these ways also avoid, you know, abstraction or um, simulation, which, you know, come with a certain politics and certain challenges. Um, and so as an effect, it also sort of removes this impetus to wait for ever higher resolution models and more correct data and more accurate data with larger computers. Um, it asks, how might we use the climate itself as guide and organizing principle? How can we design with at work intelligence of the environment right here and right now? Thank you. Tika, that was so dense, um, just absolutely um a kind of waterfall of issues and information and questions um, that I'm now trying to unpack in my head. 
Um, I, I guess my f the first question, the one that I have, um, and I should also just say that um, at the moment you're, we're talking now, I'm in a pretend office in my home in daytime Sydney. You are in your actual office in nighttime New York. Um, thanks so much for joining us, um, for, for, for joining us out of hours um, to make this possible. Um, my, my first question really is, is, is one of amazement. And it's the question is, how do you really, with these projects that are, that when we see them, they're packaged in this way, which is, has a very strong narrative and a very clear, clearly presented response to some very complicated issues. How do you start developing a project? So, so when you were in, in terms of developing synthetic messenger or solar protocol, where do those projects come from? How do you build them? And how do you build them into a, a clear narrative or and a clear performance of the, of the idea? It's, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I think there are a lot of different things that happen uh, in, in making these projects. Um, they often respond, well, I think there's, and we can see two different approaches in either one, right? So sometimes I make work in response to sort of things I'm seeing in the world that I feel like where I feel like something is missing, right? And so the, the discussion around um, geoengineering and climate response, you know, it always feels like the human piece is missing or that there's still this sort of like separation um, between human culture and it's, you know, it's it as ecology, right? It, it having an ecological um, impact and, and effect and it being ecological. Um, and so then, you know, then I'm like trying to think of ways to sort of reframe that. And so thinking about, yeah, like things that are very human, like telling stories or, you know, the news or, I'm working another piece about sleep at the moment. So like thinking about how these things are sort of also places where we make decisions and where we are living in certain ways, but they are also open for negotiation and um, change. Um, so yes, often it's a response to this sort of like dominant narrative <laughs> that I feel annoyed by or that I feel like, yeah, I wanna see it shift. Um, and Solar Protocol, a little bit of the same, right? So that project was really a coming together of many things. I was messing around with a lot of solar experiments um, with computing and just thinking about how one could run your internet or your phone or like, again, these, these uh, devices and technologies that seem like they are separate from, you know, the material world. How can you run them on in a different way? Um, uh, and then, you know, then that was sort of collided in that project with um, trying to think about automation and artificial intelligence differently, right? So, you know, all of those in design and architecture will be fully aware of how dominant, you know, that discussion around like what is the role um, of automation and AI in our work, you know, whether you're working in architecture, design, art, you know, it's touching everything. Um, and yet, you know, it's so narrow. It's such a narrow way of viewing the world, right? It relies on large amounts of data. It relies on their statistical analysis. Uh, it's a very um, unhuman way of seeing and knowing. Uh, and yet we're putting so much weight on it, right? So, you know, what other ways are there? There's a lot of other ways that we automate or the things are automated. Mm. Yeah. Who are the in devising a project, in, and in terms of these particular two projects as well, you're talk, you're, uh, you and your collaborators, Sam Levine and the other people that you work with on your projects are uh, individual actors coming together to, to produce projects. And you're talking about, you're sort of in, in dialogue or you're in opposition to enormous forces and companies you know we talked about amazon or bp or the murdoch media empire who who do you think of as your audience 
for this for these sorts of projects? Who are you trying to reach with these projects? They they de definitely work in a different registers. So, um, you know, I work as an educator. So a lot of uh, this thinking also comes out of you know ways of teaching design and ways of teaching technology. Hmm. Uh, and I think you know artistic engagements with these things like the playfulness, the ability to sort of pay attention to failure, and the freedom you kind of have for experimentation. Um, is really critical for like, um, yeah, developing a critical perspective of them. So there's definitely like the audience of my community and like part, being part of a sort of ongoing conversation. Um, but then there's always, they always also tend to break out of that and, and stimulate conversations more widely, right? So the Synthetic Messenger Project provoked uh, we got we had a lot of emails from um, climate organizations and groups saying, you know, can we use this? Is this a way we should be amplifying our work? And this is something we're we're considering and we're talking to these people about. Um, you know, is this something that could be shared um, and experimented with further? And then on the other hand, you know, the the sort of more Silicon Valley response to this was like, oh, well, it's completely, uh, it's click fraud and you're going to get the news outlets kicked off the ad networks and the bot activity will be detected and, like, you know, so very concerned that um, it sort of pushed against the logic of these systems and then it sort of breaks them or, like, transgresses how they're supposed to be used and yeah. also legitimate concerns like we don't know the effects of synthetic messenger right because these systems are really black box so it's really hard to understand if you had an impact or not but part of the project is sort of talking about that and and coming to terms with that mm -hmm. um but they're definitely uh projects about discourse right about like how do we think and talk and understand these issues different differently mm -hmm. I wanted to ask about the DNS server response of Solar Protocol. Um, when you were talking about the, the, the normal way that the system's designed so that we just get the fastest possible response, that was making me think about things like how, you know, so much of the stock market speculation now happens in these millisecond gaps where if you're closer to a you know that your proximity to the to a server, your proximity um, will actually influence how quickly you can jump on a, a stock as it escalates or something like that. What's the sort of delay time at the moment with this imperfect network you've set up? You know, at the at the small scale that exists that you're subject to um, by using the the um, the solar cell that's in the sun at that time. Look. I, I can't give you exact um, speed data, but because the site is really tiny, it's actually been surprisingly fast in terms of responsiveness, right? Because we're not doing JavaScript data collection. We're not doing Google Analytics. We're not running any kind of like heavy computational process. Mm. It's a static page generator. So that means that on the server, all the pages are generated at periodically and then just sent out as plain HTML. So it makes it surprisingly fast because, you know, this is how websites were designed in the 90s, right? And everyone thought, oh, the internet's going to be so fast. But actually we have sort of really clogged up our media just with really um, heavy uh, media, heavy virtual type of experiences. So it was surprising for that reason. It's, it's so, it's, I mean, yesterday I was reading in the papers, there's a there's current um, debate going on in Australia through the continual uptake of renewable energy, which apparently at some points of peak is providing the dominant energy source now, and whether we should be charging solar providers, household or small scale solar providers to, to when they send energy back to the grid at times when it's not demanded and there's a there's sort of various points that i can't attempt to summarize all the points of debate there but but my the big takeaway from reading about that yesterday was actually that there's an amazing reversal going on where instead of um 
local, you know, um, households or, you know, local communities needing to draw energy from big providers from these, you know, from large scale infrastructure that they're actually the producers. And they're now giving energy back to the grid and back to the collective. So they've become, it's in a weird way, it's become like, you know, those sorts of early form, you know, the, the agricultural society that existed before, in, you know, the industrial age where people could, could basically manage their own production. Um, I think that solar server is so interesting in that context because um, it may be another one of these abstract sort of techno utopias, but that does suggest a level of control that people might have over their energy demands, a level of cooperation they might have with others. Um, uh, and it's interesting to see the tensions at the moment between allowing people to be their own producers and manage their sort of power relations between themselves and the demand to, to fit in with an infrastructure that's much more abstract and it's about sort of consolidating and divvying up um, power supply. Yeah, it is, it is a big challenge. Um, this is a, something that's also happening in California, right, where, yeah, you have certain moments where the grid is really overloaded with renewable energy, but then you do have moments where you really need fossil fuel energy, like nighttime, winters, these, these types of moments. So it's, it's not a simple process by any means to make the energy transition that we need to make. Um, and, yeah. I, I'm not, I, I'm definitely um, not telling, like, yeah, teaching grid managers anything new here, right? Um, but, you know, I think the story you're telling too also just demonstrates that there is a willingness. There is a desire, a willingness and an urgency felt by most people on these issues and the, the, um, problem really is, yeah, our political class. Hmm. Um, but I think, I, I mean, I think there's also, you know, the sort of um, different logic that comes it, as if we are to move out of an sort of extraction-based um, economy and, and mode of production. Mm. Uh, and often that looks very foreign and often that looks like inefficiency, right? Um, renewables look really inefficient and problematic when you're comparing them to like fossil fuel energy in the very short, short term. But over, you know, if we look at actually a climate scale time period, time scale, then, yeah, then obviously they don't. I mean, what I find so appealing about solar protocol as a, as a narrative, as an idea, as a as a as a ethics, I guess. Um, you know, when when COVID started to impact around the world, and we had to change what we, you know, our lifestyles, our our daily habits. Um, it's obviously caused a whole lot of stress. Um, but for many of us, for, I guess for those who are of us who are more insulated or privileged, there was also this kind of um, possibility, this hope that we could start to sort of surrender or um, or give up some of the the demands of our daily existence that seem to just speed up all the time, this instantaneity that's expected of all of us, um, and the kind of this this possibility then that maybe things could slow down a little bit and give us back some sort of connection with the world around us or let us. Um, or, or reduce the expectations of, of our productivity. Um, and I think that what's really interesting about solar protocol in that context is that even most of the narratives around renewable energy, electric vehicles, um, as, you, as you showed in that wonderful sort of tableau, these kind of new um, uh, carbon economy solutions to sustaining human existence, um, you know, as, as the, as the um, climate collapses around us, um, they still, there's still this complete logic of, of production and, and extraction and, you know, and we're looking at the effects of, the, of lithium and, and, and what's required to kind of build this infrastructure that's supposed to sustain us. Um, we're just going to replace, um, you know, there's, there's, this, there's a high chance that we're just going to replace one really problematic regime for another um, uh, and still be where we are, which is basically taking too much from the planet that it can, that, that we, it can actually support. 
um, I think what the, the beauty of solar protocol is that there is there's an implied um, whether or not we know the effects and, and whether whether you know whether we can adjust them or not. There's an implied inefficiency. There's an implied sort of surrender or relaxing of expectations because we've um, we're supporting a higher order, which is an environmental order. Um, and, um, and I think that's what's really hopeful. I think that for me is, is what needs to be inserted into this dialogue about changing energy systems and paradigms where we actually also recognize that there's no complete um, uh, substitute for the way we live now, that the way we live now is actually not in itself sustainable. Yeah, right, that, that we need system transformation, but also transformation of, yeah, our sort of, cultural ideals, our, um, what we see as productivity or like what we see as what it means to be like a, you know, contributing member of society. Like I think all of that needs to shift. Um, but it's, you know, it's hard stuff. Like that is, that's a profound transformation that, that needs to happen. Um, yeah, I equally felt the same. Uh, in the early days of the pandemic where granted very privileged you know kept my job and wasn't dealing with the economic hardship that many were and still are um, but there was this sense that yeah there was this sort of like world of possibility that had opened up for, for living in a new way right paying attention to the local environment I mean I know every inch of my local park now and like prior to the pandemic, I barely went in it. And, you know, I didn't leave our neighbourhood almost for, you know, nine to ten months because we were locked down for a long time last year. So there was this real shift in attention and register and how one is living that I also am very worried that there's this big push by all the institutions that I'm a part of of and to just put things back where they were and continue on and I think a lot of us really hoped that this would be a turning point for us all and for dealing with the climate emergency um, and hope like I, I hope that it still can be but um, yes I'm seeing the same things you are in that there seems to be this huge sort of inertia to just put things back mm. yeah and I just one uh, just a follow-up question in terms of the the way that you were, you were talking about the JavaScript and the sort of the 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 reliance on on energy intensive processes that underpin this information realm that we exist within, do you think that there's a possibility then of having a kind of um, branding like sustainably sourced? sustainably sourced technology, is that possible? Could we, could we choose to use products that, that have demonstrated that they're, that they're dealing with this sort, of, this sort of extractive process in a, in a more benign way? That is a great question. Um, I mean, I, 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 maybe. <laughs> uh, one of my favourite projects um, that I think is since sort of been retired was a project called the dumb phone store and it was a you know a response to the apple store but it was full of apps that you could run on a dumb phone right so run on like an old you know 20 dollar nokia because what do you what do you really miss when you using an old piece of technology like that you don't really miss the social media and all that like you know you could do that elsewhere but you miss the maps <laughs> um, and so the Two creators of the dumb phone store, um, Alison Birch and Ramsey Nasser, that was their argument. And so then they sort of made this open source project that invited people to create applications that could run on that sort of technology. And, you know, the most popular one was the maps one, right? And it sort of was a text-based map so you could, like, ask for directions and it would help you. But I just found that project so inspiring because um, it did, you know, open up this possibility of, yeah, like, Again, this idea of progress, this idea that, you know, the iPhone 75 is better than the iPhone 74. I mean, this is just, this is not, like, this is just a marketing ploy that we're all a part of. Um, and that there could be, other, I mean, of course, you know, yes, we are stuck in a sort of ecology of software and, like, 
that project was actually massively technically challenging because it's not easy to do that stuff. So, yes, I, I, there is this inertia that, it, that is unavoidable, right, where I can't really go back. But you could. You know, like the, these systems are malleable. We have designed them. Yes, there's lots of layers and they're all interlocked and it's hard, but, mm. you know, we, it doesn't have to be the, the, the configuration that we're in right now. And I think that's also something that I'm trying to, like, push at with my work is that to, to point to that, fact that a lot of this stuff is malleable and, and arbitrary and is come out of these sort of like layers of people working on it over decades and decades. Mm. I mean, I think that's the other big takeaway for me. You have a, a book that you've recently published with Golan Levin on code as a creative medium. Um, you have a, as a background as an engineer, have become an artist. And I think in that process, you've also become um, over time increasingly computationally literate um, from what I understand. Um, and I think that that um, what's really interesting to me as the designer is, is this sort of substance that's all around me um, that conditions the environment I work in is something you've chosen to intervene in, which requires this sort of constant real time updated knowledge to understand the systems that we're using. Um, but you're also trying to educate others in how to, how to read and write those sorts of um, uh, uh, logics and protocols and understand their basis, their source code, what abstractions they rely upon. Um, I think it's really interesting. It, it suggests potentially that code is really the kind of the key medium for design today, given the way the world's constructed. Yeah, it, it has been incremental for me, that sort of um, drift into computation. Um, you know, I owe a lot, I think, to the open source, um, you know, computing arts, computing community. There's a lot of tools that, you know, I'm sure many people in, in the audience use, right? Um, such as processing P5, open frameworks, like these um, tools made by artists for artists really in, have lowered the sort of barrier to entry for, to learning and, and yeah, playing, experimenting, the, the sort of work I'm talking about, playing with these, with these tools and media. Um, and so, yeah, I really like, I think just, you know, the arts and the humanities, the digital humanities similarly is engaging with these technologies. You know, I, I really think we can't overemphasize how important and what a um, huge contribution that has been made to... Um, yeah, to understanding them, but also like critical perspectives on them, um, you know, demonstrating ways that they work, ways that they break, like what ways, you know, like seeing the world with a computer, what it leaves out. <laughs> like um, there's such a yeah, rich amount of like creative work that has, has really progressed those, those discussions. And so I think it's, yeah, just a plug for supporting the arts. <laughs> Um, there but yeah so so that uh, my book project um, that actually I think came out in Australia like a day or two ago wow, okay. um, just got just got an Australian release uh, yes so it's called Coda's Creative Medium and it's basically a, a handbook for teaching and learning um, how to make you know how to make art and design with computation and with code well I can see in my screen, I can see that my shadow has now appeared on the wall behind me, which tells me the light's changed and um, I've probably taken up um, enough of your evening time. Um, that was really inspiring. Thank you so much, Tiga, for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much. Really, really wonderful to be here. That was a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Tiga and David. It's lunchtime and on the Living Cities website forum, you can find an artwork by Keg D'Souza called Lunchtime. We commissioned it in response to respond to a menu of fresh seasonal native produce provided by Noni Beryl and her team at Mabu Mabu. Keg's menu explores the durational nature of food and asks you to draw attention to time. <laughs>